Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are our anchor. And your finished work on the cross of Calvary for us is the ground of our standing with you. That is a finished work, can never be undone. And so we cling by faith to your grace, your promises, your assurance that you give. I pray tonight as we look at your word that we would be appropriately comforted, encouraged, challenged, convicted. Lord, you know each of us here this evening. You see our hearts. You know the deep recesses. You know our anxieties and fears. You know our adversaries and you know the things we have perpetrated. And we come to you humbly as your creatures, totally dependent on your grace. We ask for help this evening to understand your word and benefit from it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We continue this evening our study of the Psalms. And my family knows that I do not like musicals. I like music. And I like movies. I I just don't like when they go together. And, and my family also knows I'm totally inconsistent in this. I have a soft spot in my heart for the sound of music and, and some other things where, where, where people sing in a movie. But, but something about it is so artificial. There's some action happening, a, a car chase or something, and bullets are flying, and all of a sudden, people just burst into spontaneous singing. And then there are harmonies as if everybody knows what to be saying at the same time together. It, it really is just phony. And you're laughing at me because you're, you're saying, well, all of Hollywood is phony. You know they're actors, right? This whole thing is scripted. I, I, I understand my inconsistencies. What we have in the book of Psalms are these prayers become music. That everybody sings together. The, the Psalms are the songbook of Israel and they are the songbook of God's people in our day. Now what's fascinating is the songwriters are recording for us the dark recesses of their own hearts. I was at a memorial service for a believing friend not long ago and, and a family member of this man sang a song at the memorial service. And it was a song he had composed that week for that purpose. And I have to think it was the most beautiful song that I had ever heard. It it had taken words from a psalm and rearranged them in some new language and set it to a new melody. And he played the piano and sang it. And it was wonderful. We come to Psalm 5 this evening and, and, and we hear the prayer of David the prophet, David the king, David the shepherd, David the sinner, David the saint singing. And we have the added benefit when we read the Psalms of someone who is superintended by the Holy Spirit to accurately compose the very words of God through human means. So we have in Psalm 5, what we will read and study this night is is the very words of God through David, sponsored by an experience of difficulty which pushed him to prayer, which then becomes prayer for public consumption. And, And we're going to enjoy this together, learn from this together, I pray be comforted in this together. And And I hope have our lives changed the way we think about difficulties and adversaries and offenses. So let's read together this song in the songbook of Israel penned by David. Psalm 5. For the choir director, upon the flutes, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Yahweh. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. O Yahweh, in the morning you will hear my voice. In the morning I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. 
For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil does not sojourn with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. Yahweh abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, in the abundance of your loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will worship in fear of you. O oh, Yahweh, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with the tongue. Hold them guilty, O oh God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the abundance of their transgressions, thrust them out. For they are rebellious against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy and may you shelter them. That those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous one, O Yahweh. You surround him with favor as with a large shield. I would summarize the psalm this way. It is a four-part response to David's being harassed by deceitful and treacherous enemies. Harassed by deceitful and treacherous enemies, David pens a song in four parts. This is his prayer. The ascription at the beginning... Uh, under the title, that, that is part of the original text, the part that says, for the choir director, upon the flute, a psalm of David. Uh, that's part of the Bible. It, the, the ascription tells us who wrote it. Sometimes it tells us under what circumstances. And in this case, the psalm writer gives instruction for how it is to be collectively expressed. In this case, a choir director and some wind instruments. Uh, the, the word for flutes here comes from uh, something with perforations. Uh, maybe the closest thing we can think of is a, uh, some sort of wind instrument with holes in it. You cover up the holes to make different notes. I prefer to think of it as a flute rather than a recorder. Uh, I'm in that realm of parenting kids who have gone through all the recorder concerts at school. Not my favorite instrument. In fact, multiplied recorders is um, less melodious than even a single one. So we'll assume they're either really good recorder players or some other wind instrument. But notice that this song is given the direction. There, there is a choir director, that is someone who's going to lead a multitude of human voices to express David's prayer all together at the same time. And it is to be accompanied by instrumentation. And not just one instrument, but in the plural, multiple wind instruments. All of this, again, just indicates for us that God has assembled these prayers, these songs, to be shared collectively, to be sung. And something happens when we sing prayers to God together, like we just sang two. There's a sort of accountability that comes with that. I'm standing next to you, you're standing next to me. We see the same words, we're saying them at the same time, and we sort of walk away from this experience saying, I know you sang what I sang, and you know that I sang what you sang. And we better mean it when we sing it, so that it's not just empty talk, it, it's not just filling the spaces, it's not just the preliminaries to a sermon, it, it is actually worship before the Lord from the heart. And God directed his people to do this very thing with these words that God wrote through David on the occasion of his own experiences. Now, we don't know what particular circumstances governed this prayer, but from the song itself, we can understand generally that, that David has been oppressed. He has been harassed by enemies, enemies that were willing to use their words in particular to afflict David. They were deceitful and treacherous. And what is David's response? He goes to God for help. David seemed to have a lot of enemies. There's an implicit lesson for us here. Don't get famous. As much as people envy the, the glamorous and the famous and, and, and those who are well known and have power, it's not wise to crave fame and fortune, followers and celebrity status. Janet and I were talking the other day about athletes who are household names. Do they read their bad press? Does Dak Prescott know what people say about him on the radio? 
Do they pay attention to their detractors? Because we read the bad press. We, we see what people say about the Diamondbacks. It, it seems the bigger your platform, the more vile and the more numerous are your haters. And David had quite a large platform. He was a target for those who were jealous of power and position. He was a, a target for uh, those whose power his mere existence threatened. David seemed to have a target on his back most of his life. In his younger days, he had enemies like the bears who wanted to eat his dad's flock of sheep. And then the Philistine giant and the Philistine armies. And then men like Saul and Absalom and all those who came against him throughout his life. And David also had spiritual enemies, those who were opposed to God for God's sake and God's ways. And they aligned themselves in opposition to David because David was loyal to Yahweh. And this morning prayer penned by David was to be sung by the nation. And we can sort of align ourselves with David in this. We can hear his words. We can sympathize with the generalities of his situation. And we can learn to go to God in such times. Here's David's four-part prayer. The first part is an early petition for help. An early petition for help. This is the first three verses. And David writes, and we sing... Give ear to my words, O Yahweh. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. O Yahweh, in the morning you will hear my voice. In the morning I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. This first section is a petition for help. And it is conducted by David early in the morning. And notice he addresses the prayer hearing God. Give ear to my words, O Yahweh. Give ear to my words. He, he is beginning in faith knowing that God hears what David prays. Those who pray from a, a liturgical or procedural or mechanical sort of human religious mode are not thinking in terms of a personal relationship to a God who hears prayer. But, but David does. And notice what he says here in verse 1. He talks about his groaning. He says, consider my meditation. Uh, this is a word that's used here and in Psalm 39 to describe the inner thoughts. The New American Standard translates it groaning. The Legacy Standard talks about meditation. The idea is words not quite expressed. He's asking God to, to hear his words and, and even to hear them when they are merely inward thoughts. And this begins a progression in this first section that moves from inner thoughts to an out loud cry to a well-arranged verbal petition. And, and we need to see this progression. That This first one, the meditations or the groaning is inarticulate. And it reveals a heart in David that is ready for prayer at all times, even when the words won't quite come out. An upward heart looking to God for help even when I can't put expression to my thoughts. Have you ever been there? Just the meditative groaning directed toward the Lord. Ah. Before the words are formed, David has a heart of prayer. And this progresses in verse 2 to a cry. Look what he says. Give heed to the sound. Now we're out loud. Of my cry for help. Uh, this progression has turned from inward thoughts to, a, to a, an outcry. This is the sound of a soul stirred by trouble. It is a sound that, as Spurgeon said, reaches the very heart of God. Now, children cry. Babies cry. I'm convinced that there's somebody in the hospital who... Hands newborns a business card, sort of a, a job description, and tells them what to do, and it just says, cry a lot. That's your job for a while. The babies know how to do that. They, they do it all the time. And, and crying is a tonal language. That is, not all cries are the same. And, and attentive parents learn the difference between the protest cry, 
I'm not going to demonstrate it for you. The rebellious cry, the, the, the whimper of complaint, the, the sharp cry of pain, the tears of sorrow. And when the plaintive cry of a beloved child goes up, signifying helplessness and need, the heart of a mom is stirred to action. She runs to meet that need with tenderness and affection and strength. Sometimes in the middle of the night while the dad rolls over and says, what's going on? (laughs) Our God is an infinitely strong and compassionate father whose heart is stirred by the cry of his children asking for help. David's inner thoughts move to an outward cry for help. And notice how he addresses God in verse 2. My king and my God. That is, David's relationship to God is personal. These are personal, possessive pronouns. God is no stranger to David, and David is no stranger to God. This is relational. David, as king, recognizes the true king, and this is fascinating. David's the king of Israel. He's writing a song, and and he addresses someone else as king. It says, my king and, and my God. You see, David has authority over earthly resources, but God has authority over David. And God has authority over all things. And, and all of the world's resources at the disposal of some earthly king, even, even a king over a world power in its golden age, are not enough to meet men's deepest needs. David knows that. And David turns to God, and so he says, for to you I pray. Now, this last little phrase in verse 2 are are not filler words. I mean, it kind of repeats the things we've been saying. David is addressing God, and, and David is praying. Why does he need to say here, for to you I pray? Does he need to fill out some more words to finish out the melody line of the song? You know, I had a really good flute thing going, and I need some more words to go in it, fill it in. Maybe you've listened to songs, and it seems like these lyrics are just sort of, man, they didn't know what else to say. They just added some gobbledygook in there. These are not filler words. When when David says, for, to you I pray, he's giving an explanation of everything he said up to this point, and he is declaring an exclusive address of the one who can help him. He is saying, for to you, I pray. And this is so important. Who else could listen? Who else could hear the the internal mutterings of a troubled heart? Who else could listen to the out loud cry in a in a prayer closet in a room all by yourself? Who who else could do anything about it? This is an exclusive claim of faith in the one true God who answers prayer. There's no one else David could pray to. There's no one else that could answer him in his time of need. And he closes out this section with verse 3. O Yahweh, again that personal name of God, the the, the self-existent covenant-keeping God of Israel who has set his affections on David personally. In the morning, O Yahweh... You will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and and eagerly watch. David says he he turns to Yahweh in the morning, the the first part of the day. And and we might think, well, yes, of course, we should pray in the morning because it's a good time to concentrate. It's just a great time to pray. It's a good pattern to set. I I don't think David's expression here is a matter of of pattern, although uh, probably he prayed in the morning regularly. But but I think for David here, the concerns on his heart are consuming his thought life. And this is what he's thinking about when he first gets up. He, He wakes up troubled and he must go to the Lord. This is urgent. He comes to the Lord in the morning and and he has confidence that God hears. This is faith. And so he says, in the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. The word for order in this text is is a word that means to prepare or to set out in orderly arrangement. 
It was used often in the temple worship vocabulary. The, the priests would, using this word, prepare the wood for the fire of the sacrifice. They would arrange the pieces of the sacrificial animal on that sacrificial altar. They would carefully place the lamps in the tabernacle. They would place the showbread where it belongs. And this word is used often in that sort of public tabernacle worship. The word is also used in a legal setting to describe setting out a case at law, or even in the 23rd Psalm of preparing a feast in an orderly fashion. And what David uses this word to describe here is the orderly arrangement of prayer. And, and, and this can be a good thing to do. Maybe you keep a prayer journal. Maybe you keep lists. Maybe you uh, use your iPhone notes to track what you're praying for and to track answers to prayer. And, and these are all really good exercises. I think it's modeled for us here by David. Perhaps David thinks here of a template for prayer. I like to use Psalm 95 as a way to guide prayer. It sort of takes you through a, a high view of God and gratitude for God's gracious giving of things and, and then into petitions and trust. Some of you have used the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. That's a helpful template. It reminds me to worship God first, thank Him second, confess my sin. I got it backwards. Worship Him first, confess my sin, express gratitude to Him, and then start asking Him for stuff. And it's a remarkable way to think about how to put God first in my prayers to God. And so this orderly arrangement is helpful. Jesus gave His disciples the disciples' prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. That's a helpful template. It's not designed by Jesus for you to memorize it and then utter it rote without meaning the words. It's designed by Jesus for you to take the concepts in the disciples' prayer and use them as a template for how to talk to God in a personal relationship. Maybe you use the prayers of Paul as a template for praying for one another in this church, a wonderful exercise. All of this is preparation. And, and remember the progression, we went from inner murmurings to out loud cry for help to ordered, carefully prepared addressing of God in petition. And, and, and then what happens here in this last line of verse 3, it is preparation and then expectation. In the morning, I'll order my prayer and then I will eagerly watch. This is the expectation of, of anticipation and hope and faith. I've talked to God, He hears me, and He will answer. He loves His children. He listens to prayer. He invites us to address Him in prayer, and He meets our needs. David is expressing here an eager expectation, an eagerly watch of expectant faith that, that I'm going to see what God's going to do. And again, this takes prayer out of the mechanical, impersonal, or procedural. I mentioned before that Scott Demarest and I went to the, the western uh, regions of China, to the Tibetan regions, and, and we were in the Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, and, and we watched the way these very religious people who don't know their maker prayed, and they prayed a lot. And they would crawl on hands and knees across stone and pavement to get to this temple complex, muttering things all along the way in vain repetition. They would light yak butter wax candles that smelled really bad and, and sent acrid smoke filling all of the rooms. And, and by lighting the candles, the, the flame on the wick would wave and, and that was prayer. And every movement of the, of the flame and every tracing of the smoke up to the ceiling was this prayerful activity that earned you points towards heaven or their conception of it. And then they had these prayer wheels and the priests and the, and the religious devotees would, would walk by these walls of prayer wheels and they would just spin them. And, and as these prayer wheels spin, they're doing prayer mechanically on behalf of the worshiper. The mind's not engaged in any kind of personal relationship with the maker of the universe. But the mechanical thing of prayer is being done and it is empty and it is vain. 
If you've seen the mountain climbers in the Himalayas, they're, they're always standing around these flags and banners. That's not a finish line. Those are, those are prayer flags, and, and they are placed there so that the, the wind high up on these mountains would flap the flags, and, and every flap of the flag is a prayer done by the person who put the flag there. Again, it's just empty, vain repetition of, of mechanical religiosity. It has nothing to do with actually addressing the, the, the God who made you and sustains you and the God who could actually answer prayer. And so David here, carefully preparing his petitions before the Lord and addressing him as a loving father and then eagerly anticipating what God will do in response demonstrates real, spirit-wrought, heartfelt prayer. The kind that pleases the Lord. The, the kind we ought to participate in. This is hope and patience and, and faith. We cast our cares and we eagerly watch. Even as we move from inarticulate groaning to crying aloud to orderly arrangement, all of this is what we ought to be doing in addressing our loving Father. We move to the second section, beginning in verse 4, and this is an appeal to the character of God. The second portion of, of David's prayer set to song, as he's under the oppression of deceitful and treacherous enemies, is an appeal to the character of God. Look at verse 4. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil does not dwell with you or, or travel with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. Yahweh abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, in the abundance of your loving kindness, I will enter your house at your holy temple. I will worship in fear of you. And this section of the psalm has a, a rhythmic sort of climactic approach to the top and then a, a drop off, a, a sort of a surprising denouement or conclusion of this section. And we're ascending this hill of, of addressing these, these evil ones who are oppressing David. And then in verse 7, we take the, the turn of, of a contrast to one who's experienced his grace and listen, as we go to God in prayer, especially under trouble and affliction, and we're appealing to the character of God, as David does here, there are two sides of God's character that are in, on display. The, the justice of God, the, the abject holiness of God and His hatred of sin, and the grace of God and His forgiveness of sin. They're both in this stanza. David begins... In verse 4, the, the, the word for in the English text is appropriate here. The character of God is a basis for appeal. David is asking for help. Why can he ask for help against bad guys? Because God does not delight in badness. He doesn't delight in wickedness. He actually hates it. And so you can appeal to one who is good and loves what is good to do what is right in the face of what is bad. If God were immoral or amoral, David could make no such appeal. But he's able to appeal on the basis of God's character. He wants help against his enemies. If God didn't care about right and wrong, if he had no sense of justice, or if he didn't care about his children when they're mistreated, David could not make this request. But verse 4, he has confidence that God is just. And he says it negatively, you're not a God who delights in wickedness. In other words, God cannot let sin go on forever. Sin cannot continue to be unpunished. And we experience the temptations of thinking that either God doesn't care about me or God really isn't concerned with that people do what's right. And we have those temptations because we, we sit in the, the moving picture of life when God hasn't finished the story yet. And, and we experience the injustices. We, we look at a world around us filled with people that aren't doing what's right and they don't seem to care about God and, and we're tempted to wonder, does God care about them? And David affirms, no evil dwells with you. No evil goes with you in your tent or, or sojourns with you. It, it doesn't take up residence where you are. Evil is not at home with God. 
Theologians talk about theodicy. Theodicy is a, a good college word. It, it just means the, the problem of evil. Uh, how can God exist if evil exists? How can God be good if evil exists? How can God be powerful if, God, if evil exists? God can't exist, be good, and be powerful if evil exists, right? That's the philosopher's conundrum. And of course, the Bible would tell us, well, absolutely evil exists, and God exists, and God is good, and God is all-powerful. He just has a purpose for evil. It's not a, it's not a difficult answer to a difficult question. This psalm assumes God's goodness, assumes God's power, appeals to his character in the presence of evil that has not yet gone away. In other words, David implicitly trusts a biblical theodicy or a, a biblical purpose in God for evil. By the way, if you want further reading on that topic, I would recommend to you Scott Christensen's book, entitled, What About Evil? It's been a recommended book. We, we have it back there on the book table. It is probably the best treatment on that topic. That's all in the backdrop here for this psalm. Look at verse 5. David affirms, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. These are the, the foolish boasters. The word here indicates a whole lot of noise with no substance, no truth. Those who are antagonistic to David here are, are living in the pride as if there is no God. They say many words as if God doesn't hear what they're saying or, or know what they're thinking or, or care about it at all. Their many words are empty drivel. And what does David affirm in faith? They shall not stand. Just like Psalm 1, they, they will not stand in the judgment. They will be blown away like chaff. And this is an encouragement to David and an encouragement from David to us to take the long view. God is just. He will do what's right. He will uphold what is right, even if it means that we must wait. They will get their time now to bloviate, but the winds of judgment are coming. Jonathan Edwards gave a, an illustration of, of God's mercy as a dam, a great water retention device holding back a massive flood of waters. That's God's mercy. That, that flood of waters is God's righteous judgment, His righteous response to sin. But it's not pouring down on those who perpetrate sin yet. What's holding it back? God's timing, His purpose, His mercy. And as Jonathan Edwards says, someday that dam will break and out will flow all of that judgment against man's unforgiven sins. It's a reflection of what Paul says in Romans 2. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up for yourselves God's wrath in the day of his wrath. In the day of God's judgment, when his righteous judgment will be revealed, he will give to each person according to what he has done. And men don't see the judgment right away. They just keep putting more water behind the dam. And so that's an encouragement to God's people to be patient and wait. Truly to wait for the awful realization of what happens when that dam breaks. But it's also a warning for all those who take sin lightly now. It is an insanity, a, a rather bold insanity, when creatures sin without fear. They assume God's okay with it. They assume God doesn't see it. Or maybe that God doesn't exist at all. And that is a very bad bargain. Notice what David says next. You hate all workers of iniquity. Or in the New American Standard, you, you hate all who do iniquity. And we ask the question, how does God feel about sin? And it's a ready response for us to say, Go, well, God hates sin. And we might even uh, spit out the, the very common phrase, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. But this text goes farther. D do you see it? God hates the doers of iniquity. God hates the sinner. This is a, a biblical truth and an inescapable one. And, and the sinner here is a, a categorical label for those who sin and don't take refuge in his grace. 
Uh, just the way the first five Psalms use the categories of the sinner and the righteous. Uh, the righteous are not those who have never sinned. The, the righteous are those who are given righteousness by God's grace in the gospel, who have taken refuge in the judge of all the earth, and whose lives are characterized by trusting in him. The sinner categorically is the one who rejects God's grace and goes on rebelling against God. And as we think about what the Bible says about God's attitude toward those in rebellion against Him, we must affirm what Psalm 5 says. God hates them. And we would also affirm that the Bible makes it clear that God loves them. And that's not a contradiction in God. For God to love the unlovely, the wicked at their worst, is actually a part of His character. In fact, he encourages us Christians, love your enemies and you'll be like your father in heaven. And then God gives the examples of how particularly he loves his enemies. That is those who are not in a right relationship with him. He graciously gives them things they don't deserve, that they don't thank him for, and that they need rain and sunshine in their appropriate times. We, we call this God's common grace or his general love for sinners. It's different than his particular saving love, but it is love nonetheless. And it is a love we are to imitate. But you cannot get away from the fact that God also hates those who are opposed to him. And this enmity goes both ways. David, the same psalm writer, writes in Psalm 21, 8, O oh God, your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. The Bible makes it clear that outside of Christ, we are at enmity with him and that God is at enmity with us in our rebellion. But God does not hate those who have sinned, but have taken refuge in him. In fact, God protects those who come to him for refuge. And what are we going to God for refuge from? God. God himself from his just wrath against our sin. It is appropriate when we use the very common colloquial Christian phrase, saved, for us to ask, what are we saved from? Of course, we're saved from sin and its consequences. We're saved from ourselves. We're saved from Satan and his blinding influence. And we're saved from slavery. And, and, and we're saved from hell. And, and in the end, ultimately, we are saved from God, by God, unto God. That is what David describes here. And, and this is a comfort to David that, that there is a just end for the wicked that is coming. It's a, it's a comfort to David that, that, that God hates the wicked, the doers of iniquity. Because, listen, they're, they're bothersome to David. They're, they're an annoyance to David. All of us have experienced sins and injustices. And, and, and we would be foolish to think, oh, it's just okay for injustice to go on and on and on and on and on. And it is a comfort for us to recognize that God's holy vehemence is aimed against every injustice with far more anger than you and I could or would or should ever muster. That's a comfort. God's delay is not indifference. In Ecclesiastes 8.11, Solomon says, the, sin, uh, the sons of men are given more fully to do evil because the sentence is not executed quickly. And that's been true of all of history. God's mercy, holding back his just wrath, is misunderstood for leniency. And so sinful men lean on his leniency, abuse his kindness, ignore his love, reject his forgiveness, and go to a just end. And how terrible will it be to meet him if your standing has not been changed before God, if your nature has not been changed before God, if your record has not been changed before God. If his anger has not found another object besides you and is only left to give full attention to your unforgiven sins, you are in an eternity of trouble. And this is where we just thank God for the gospel that that anger is diverted, directed towards someone else, a, a substitute in our place that God himself provides. 
As you look at this verse, Yahweh abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Verse 6. Can you think of anybody that is famous for bloodshed? Maybe famous for deceit? Can you think of any characters in the Bible that are famous for their bloodshed or, or famous for their deceit? Maybe the author of this psalm. <laughs> David is so famous for his sin, his sin against Bathsheba, and his deceit to the nation, and his covering it up by the murder of his friend and faithful compatriot Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He's so famous for that, that when David is listed in the genealogy of Jesus, he's listed according to those sins. The whole world sings David's songs, <laughs> and the whole world has access to his criminal record. In Psalm 143, verse 2, this same David pleaded with the Lord, Do not enter into judgment with your servant, <laughs> for in your sight no man living is righteous. David knows he needs something beyond mere justice. And so this stanza closes in verse 7. But as for me, by your great grace, I'll enter your house. But as for me, by your great grace, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. This is the confidence of faith. This is not an empty boast here. This is a man who knows grace, the only basis, the only way in, and great grace. David was a man who sinned, and he sinned greatly. And, and he just recorded for us that God abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. And David says, so, so I'm going to get close to this God who really, really hates the kinds of things I've done. I'm going to get close to him. Listen, only grace can do that. Only a spirit-wrought fear of Yahweh, fear of the Lord, can bring you to this great, infinitely large, awful, just, holy God with love and affection. And this is stunning because in verse 4 we just read, no evil dwells with you, no evil in your house, but I'll go into your house. Listen, how could David say such a thing? How could we sing such a thing? Only the gospel. And we have the vantage point now of looking from this side of the cross at, at the great son of David, at, at God the son who came in the flesh and went to the cross to pay for our sins so that as Paul said in Romans 4, God might justify the ungodly, declare righteous, the unrighteous, to bring us to him. And we believe by faith that Jesus completely paid for our sins. We don't get into the house of God but on our merit. We don't get in because we're different than those bad guys. Except for this. We have taken refuge in the God who hates evil. And has provided a solution to the evil in us. This is a remarkable perspective. You might be tempted to think that David must have written this one before he sinned with Bathsheba. You know, Psalm 5 comes before Psalm 51. Um, maybe, we don't know when this psalm was written, but we do know that Psalm 3 was written before Psalm 51. These are not chronological. Psalm 3 is about David running away from Absalom. In addition to that, Psalm 5 and Psalm 51 are both in the songbook for Israel. We're supposed to sing these things. They're both in here. And so all Israel is to know that the only way for sinners to get close to this God who hates sinners is to enter by abundant loving kindness, by great grace. And notice the effect of the fear of the Lord here. At your holy temple, David sings, I will worship in fear of you. Spurgeon summarizes this part of the prayer this way. I will not stand at a distance I will come into your sanctuary just as a child comes into his father's house, but I will not come in on my own merits. No, I have a multitude of sins and therefore I will come in on the multitude of thy mercy. I will approach there with confidence because of thy immeasurable grace. 
And that leads to a third stanza, a third section of the song, an urgent plea for justice, beginning in verse 8. O Yahweh, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. He's describing his problem. He says, these are my foes, but the solution is not in David. He says, I need your righteousness and I need your straight path in verse 8. It's David's dilemma, but God's solution. And remember, David, with all of his wealth and power and access, did not lean on those things for this solution. We need to be dependent. It's hard to be dependent on God when you have everything. It's one of the benefits of trials. God takes things away. He he takes away the three legs on a three-legged stool and you're left just being dependent. It's a good place to be. In verse 9, we get a description of David's enemies. Nothing reliable in their mouth. Their inward part is its self-destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. These are unstable, untrustworthy people who are using their words to afflict David. Their internals are destruction. This is a graphic depiction. He says their throat is an open grave. That is, their treacherous and deceitful words against David are depicted as open sepulchers, an an open pit ready to receive corpses. They're ready to swallow up everyone they can catch, bring about their demise, and all the while they flatter with their tongue. It's the smooth speech that covers over the destructive intent. This verse is quoted in Romans 3.13 when Paul is delineating the sinfulness of all humanity. He says, their throats are open graves. Paul there is talking about Jew and Gentile alike, everybody. Here, David highlights in his adversaries what is true of the human race by nature. And so he appeals to God in verse 10, hold them guilty. This is one word, it's a verb. It doesn't come over in English very easily. It's like the opposite of the word justify. Uh, We might make up a word and say, guiltify them. (laughs) Recognize their state before you. Make the judicial declaration that they are guilty and hold them accountable. David prays, by their own devices, let them fall. Uh, Let them suffer the consequences of their sins and then reject them, thrust them out, he says. And he says, thrust them out in the multitude of their transgressions, still in their sin, liable to punishment. This is like the depart from me, I never knew you. It's like the message to Adam and Eve, go out of the garden. It's like those awful words in Revelation 20, whoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Just a a, a final judicial consequence and rejection. I read the last line. For, this is the explanation for this prayer, they are rebellious against you. This is so instructive for us. This is a recognition of whose honor is truly scorned when people perpetrate injustices against us. This really isn't about us. One of the basic rules of photography is to account for everything in the frame. Do you know what that means? I'm going to help all of your iPhone pictures right now. Uh, When you're getting up there to take a picture, look at everything in the background, everything along the sides, and make sure it's the stuff you want to be in there. And, And if it's got stuff in there you don't want to be in there, change it, rearrange it, set it up different. It's a basic rule of photography. A basic rule of firearms is be certain of your target and be certain of what's behind it. Mind the backdrop. In sinning against David, his adversaries have not accounted for everything in the frame. They have captured in their offending another person than David, a person of infinite value, a person who will hold them accountable for their offenses. In in their shooting at the firearms range or, or in their battle against David, they've taken their shots at a target. They, they see David in the crosshairs, but, but they have hit the heart of David's God. And they're in deep trouble. Remember this, Christian. When someone sins against you, they have offended someone who is blameless and holy and just. You deserve to be offended. (laughs) In fact, you will never get all that you deserve in this life, even if the whole world were to set its face against you. This is why we don't exact revenge. 
We as sinners can never be the judge of sin. We could never judge it rightly. We could never arbitrate it correctly. We would never get the proportions correct. We could never get our sinful, vindictive selves out of the way enough to be unbiased. But God can and does. And David here is right to appeal to God for justice on the basis of God's having been offended. David prays that they be punished, and it's actually an expression of faith that God will do just as he promised. And listen, this prayer is not opposed to Stephen's prayer. Remember Stephen's prayer? They're throwing rocks at him for following Jesus, and they're throwing rocks at him until he stops breathing. And Stephen's prayer publicly to God in front of them, for them, was, forgive them. Listen, in the heart of a Christian, you you can pray that your enemies will come to their senses and not go to the lake of fire. And you can pray that God's honor and his name would be vindicated on the earth. These things go together. God's people rightly languish under the injustices in our world until God sets them all right. If you want the heavenly perspective on this, read the first half of Revelation 19. There, heaven rejoices at God's judgment against sinners. And heaven is populated by people who used to be in that mass of sinners who deserved the judgment. There's an appropriate heavenly perspective there. Listen, our adversaries may succeed for a time against us. They may be smarter, richer, more influential. They may have powerful friends, legal resources, access to corrupt systems. But they cannot outwit God. They cannot outspend God. They cannot outlawyer God or strong arm God. At the end of all days, they will have no allies. They will have no strength. They will be stripped of every advantage, every resource, every shelter, and they will stand alone and accountable before the unflinching bar of the justice of God. You can trust in that. And God takes an interest when his precious ones are mistreated. You can write down 2 Thessalonians 1.5. 2 Thessalonians 1.5, we won't turn there. God will defend his people. He loves his children. He, he will set things right. The, the sins committed against his children are sins against God primarily, and he will take up the cause of his children. Remember when Jesus said to Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? God feels it when his people are treated unjustly. We may have to wait. We do so with prayer and trembling. And listen, God is just when he forgives your enemies. If he were to exact the justice, do your detractors on the substitute person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God is good and just and putting himself on display to be honored and glorified. And God is also just if he punishes those who do not take refuge in him. Romans 3, 4 said God will be just when you judge. And Romans 3, 26 said God will be just when he justifies the ungodly. He can do both of those, all of those. The psalm ends the last two verses with a collective praise for grace, part four. We read these words in this section, refuge and shelter and shield. It means that the threat is still present. And yet we read words like exaltation and singing for joy. Trials produce for us dependence on the Lord. That dependence on the Lord actually proves the character of God for us experientially. And then that proven character of God produces in us a gladness, a collective singing, a trust for the future, singing with joy, exulting in him, testifying of his trustworthiness. And then this has the effect of helping others trust him and rejoice. Verse 12 says, it is you who bless the righteous one. Again, righteous here is a categorical statement of those who have trusted in God's grace. And you surround him with favor as with a large shield. Notice in verse 11 how these who are shielded are described. They are the ones who love your name. So we understand God's 
Forgiveness of the wicked here by grace is not a, a winking at sin, but, but a transformation of a life from those who are rebelling against him to those who identify with him and actually love him. I want you to consider the work of God. How is God at work when you are mistreated by malevolent miscreants? If, if, you, were, if you were in David's shoes, if you're experiencing something like David experienced, and, and there are treacherous and deceitful enemies who are out to get you, you should be asking, what is the Lord doing? It's probably not one thing. Of course, we, we would want to think about what God is doing in our own spiritual growth, producing dependence and, and refining us and, and producing repentance for things we hadn't seen before this trial. Secondly, consider God getting glory as a refuge. There's trouble. I'm going to run to God. This honors him. It actually puts his refuge character on display before a watching world. We see that in David. We all learn by David's example. David's in trouble. He goes to God and he prays in the morning. Thirdly, consider God's glory in theodicy. God's ability to use evil for good purposes. Fourthly, consider God's work at getting glory for himself in mercy. His mercy of, of not punishing the wicked just yet, but actually giving time for repentance. No doubt there are people you pray for right now that are currently under the wrath of God, that you would long for them to know the gospel. So God gets glory in his mercy, holding back due judgment. And then fifthly, God is up to something in getting glory for himself in judgment. It is right for God to be a holy judge. It is right for him to judge sin in final judgment. It is actually a reflection of his beauty and holiness and goodness and love of all that is good. God will get glory for himself in judgment. He will even get glory for himself in the way the vessels of his wrath store up for themselves wrath for that final day. God is up to something. Even when your enemies are sinning against you, there's something bigger going on. And then, of course, know that God is working out glory for himself in salvation. A man like David, a man notorious for deceit and bloodshed. Welcome in God's house as a beloved child. And if you're a Christian here this evening, that's your story. So we see God's working in all of these things. I'll close with this from John Calvin. He said, we may be exposed to a thousand deaths but this one consideration ought abundantly to suffice us that we are covered and defended by the hand of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a shield to us. As we sung earlier this evening, a, an anchor for us in, in troubling waters, in seasons of storm. You ride our ship. You are with us. You care for us. And you have even given us songs like this to rehearse your goodness. Your goodness both in, in mercy and in judgment. And of course, we love to give you praise for your abundant loving kindness. Your great grace on the basis of which we come into your house with joy. We pray all this in the name of Jesus whose blood makes this a reality. Amen.